Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. I know. Thank you all for braving the snowstorm, the slush, whatever you braved to get here tonight for this very critical and urgent conversation on immigrant rights. My name is Suheili Bautista Carolina. I work at the Brooklyn Museum as the community relations manager. Um, we're very, very excited to have you. If this is your first time at the Brooklyn Museum, welcome. I hope that you'll return for a lineup of public programs that is always incredible and exciting and relevant. Um, if this is not your first time at the Brooklyn Museum, then welcome back. I hope that this is one of your many homes for arts and culture. Um, I would like to, again, thank you for being here for Defending Immigrant Rights, a Brooklyn Call to Action, which is a program that we're putting together, uh, hosted by the Brooklyn Museum, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, which celebrates its 10-year anniversary this year and also the Brooklyn Community Foundation. So I would like to, with no further ado, introduce the Executive Director of the Brooklyn Community Foundation, Ms. Cecilia Clark. I think we have to do uh, an extra thank you for all of you here, because you came through this incredible weather. So a real clap for the audience, thank you. Um, so for the second time, interestingly, maybe I'm just, this is going to be my a consistent role for me, I am really honored to channel Elizabeth. I've been emailing with Elizabeth all day, um, and she couldn't make it. I think intraborough, uh, intraborough travel is especially tricky. So she uh, extends her apologies for not being here, and she sent some remarks, uh, some brief remarks I'm just going to read. Um, the Sackler Center has been hosting programs on social issues for 10 years. We've laid a good groundwork for this day. And I'm proud of the museum, our thousands of communities in the audience, and the hundreds of participants for consistent engagement. In addition to equal pay, equal wall space, the Sackler Center has stood since it opened as a beacon for equality, equity, and justice. Warm regards to all on a very cold day and solidarity in the months ahead. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so, of course, I really want to extend my thanks to Elizabeth, whom I, whom I just channeled, um, and Anne, um, and Pastor Nick, where are you? Uh, because I love reaching out to two women um, at about 11 in the morning and by about one in the afternoon, these three women together have planned this event. Um, and this all in response to the appalling current events that we were feeling um, really horrified by, um, but also really called to action, which is why this is, of course, called a call to conversation. So thank you very much, Anne, and the museum for hosting us tonight. And it's an honor to partner with you. Um, so the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Community Foundation is proud to partner with Brooklyn nonprofits, generous donors, and inspiring Brooklyn leaders as we work towards a mission to spark lasting social change for a fair and just Brooklyn. Since 2009, we've awarded more than 33 million in grants to Brooklyn nonprofits, taking on challenges as varying as criminal justice, school discipline reform, increasing access to the arts, and building the leadership pipeline for young people of color and to responding to the immediate crisis and long-term rebuilding after Hurricane Sandy. Brooklyn Community Foundation brings people who care deeply, brings together people who care deeply about our communities to lift up local expertise and fuel community-led solutions to the greatest challenges of our day. That's why, just a few weeks after the November election, we created the Immigrant Rights Fund. I need to call out my board member, Gabe Schwartz, because it really was his urging that we did it. He called me two days after the election. And it was made possible thanks to his incredible generosity, along with a few other members of our board, some of whom are here tonight, who helped seed fund and put us well on our way to a million dollar commitment over the next four years to supporting nonprofits fighting for immigrant rights across Brooklyn. This week, we issued nearly 100,000 in immediate response grants to eight nonprofits through the Immigrant Rights Funds. This is our, our first phase. And we also announced the creation of an action fund to support civil resistance and organizing. We want as many Brooklynites to stand up and be strong. 
You can learn more about the Immigrant Rights Fund on our website, brooklyncommunityfoundation.org, including how nonprofits and community groups can apply for grants. And of course, you can donate too, please. You may, real, you, you may not realize it, but Brooklyn is home to over 990, we can call it a million, foreign-born residents. Nearly 40% of this borough is foreign-born. And I also believe that over 50% of the borough does not speak English at home. So when that executive order came down, you can imagine that half the population of this borough heard that loud and clear. And until this past month, you may also not have realized that Brooklyn is home to the, the nation's leading immigrant rights organizations and advocates from whom you're gonna hear tonight. Our foundation is privileged to be a longtime funder and partner to so many of them. And it is at times like these that demonstrate why it's so important that we support their advocacy and organizing efforts. At Brooklyn Community Foundation, we truly believe that those who are closest to the challenge are closest to the solution, which is why we have gathered these outstanding leaders and organizers here today. We want to listen and to follow their lead in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. It's gonna be a long fight. We have a great evening ahead, but before we turn to the panel, I'd like to introduce Bita Mustafi, Assistant Commissioner at the Mayor's Office on Immigrant Affairs. Bita, thank you. Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming out in this weather. Um, thank you to the Brooklyn Community Foundation and of course the Brooklyn Museum and the panelists that are about to join us to have a wonderful conversation. To get us started, I actually just want to say, does everybody just know the news that came down? Yeah! yeah. So for those who are unaware, um, the Ninth Circuit just upheld the temporary restraining order on the executive order, the um, travel and refugee ban. We'll take every victory, big and small, and celebrate it. We have to. So as Cecilia said, I'm Bita Mustofi. I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. For those who are unfamiliar with our office, Truly at its core, the work that we do is immigrant inclusion. We work to ensure that all immigrant New Yorkers are part of the city, that they have access to justice, and we advocate for continued immigration reforms at all levels of government in order to eliminate inequities that impact New York immigrant communities every day. We stand with our communities, with immigrant communities. Our mission now is more important than ever and recently, the president's executive orders, we responded, the mayor, by saying that our resolve remains the same, to be a safe and welcoming city for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Nothing about those announcements changes who we are here in New York City. A pen in DC doesn't change our values or what we stand for. We will use all the tools at our disposal as a city to fight and protect immigrant communities. So what are we doing? What is the call to action? What have we already done? We want people to know that irregardless of what the news has been, immigrant families can still, in this city, access health care services, education, emergency food and shelter, and a range of other services. You can get ID regardless of your status through IDNYC. All New Yorkers have the right to be free from unlawful discrimination and retaliation and harassment in the workplace, housing, and public places. So you can connect to our Human Rights Commission and report any bias that you might experience. We have the strong, one of the strongest human rights local laws in the country and we want to make sure people know that and are, are reporting incidents so that we can follow up accordingly. We have launched Thrive NYC Well, making sure that people in this moment where there is real fear and uncertainty have access to mental health services in the language that they speak and in the communities that they live. 
Also, as I said, one of the core principles of our office is access to justice. We have Action NYC. It's one of the programs we're most proud of, working with community partners so that people can receive free and safe immigration legal help in the communities that they live and in the languages that they speak. Recently, Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Mark Viverito released a one-page resource guide that outlines these, among other resources that are available to immigrant communities. It's available online on our website and in many different languages, and so we encourage you as a quick and easy resource to get information out so people know what their rights are, to share it, and if you want uh, any more information on how to get it, I'm happy to provide that. We're also doing an increased number of Know Your Rights forums, making sure that we're out in the community with our sister agencies, sharing information, making sure that people know that nothing has changed in this moment in terms of the city's policies and programs and that they can access this information and rights. But where do we need to go and what needs to happen now? From our purview, we think cities need to come together, that this is really a time for local municipalities to fight together. We are part of a, a national coalition called Cities for Action working collectively around the country to fight for immigration reform, to fight to protect our immigrant communities, and as I said, the values that we hold dear here in New York City. We've done this before. We've fought against attempts by Congress to cut off federal funding to cities that are immigrant inclusive, um, and we've successfully fought against it, and we'll continue to do that. We've weighed in in the past on legal fights, on executive action, and we'll continue to do that as well. We've also been thinking about how we can be innovative locally. And one example of that is we just launched, or we will be launching, a legal and outreach capacity building fellowship for small immigrant serving organizations. Because now is the time that we all have to get organized and we all have to get ready. And we've continued to do convenings with our partners. We don't do any of this alone. We do this with sister agencies. We do this with some of the incredible organizations that are represented here tonight. One example of that is just, I believe yesterday, every day feels like a year. Um, we did a day of action with our Department of Consumer Affairs and our Human Rights Commission, along with the Arab American Association of New York, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the New York Immigration Coalition, and others, to do concerted information sharing in the communities where individuals were the most impacted by the executive orders that came down in the last few weeks. We can't do that work alone. We rely on the leadership of the community organizations and the advocates that we work with, as I said, and all of you to make sure that each and every one of us are holding each other accountable and are continuing to get good information out, connecting people to the right resources and organizing and fighting together. So where does that leave us? I think from our perspective, as I said, we as a city, we're ready to stand firmly committed to working with cities across the country, advocates locally, individuals, in making sure that none of these policies that, as I said, do not reflect our values or who we are, impact our neighbors, our family members, our friends, our colleagues, our New Yorkers. None of the policies that get implemented will we allow to threaten our communities, and we will fight back, and we will use whatever tools we have at our disposal. And I want to thank, again, the Brooklyn Community Foundation for setting up a forum like this to give us an opportunity to have some of these hard conversations and to really think about how can we be coordinated and responsive to the moment that we're in. How can we stand together and how can we live by example in New York City in fighting to protect all of our communities. Thank you so much. I just, it, Listening to Bita made me realize that there are so many opportunities in this city to get involved. And I know a lot of people have been calling our office, and I'm sure this is uh, similar around the city, about, you know, what can I do? Um, because as Bita said, you know, every day there's another thing. Um, I saw a great sign on Instagram, of course, saying protest is the new brunch. 
So certainly, <laughs> I, I certainly do think continue to protest, but I just want to reemphasize that the foundation is very serious about its immigrant rights fund. So if you know even really small immigrant-led groups, even community leaders who need money to organize protests, please come to us. That's our action fund. We also have a sustained response fund. Um, those are larger grants, uh, really trying to build the capacity of immigrant-led organizations in Brooklyn. Um, so I just want to be clear that that's what we're doing, um, and I'm sure all of you are also doing really amazing work. So I'm so honored to introduce tonight's panelists because this is really a group of people who, as I say, are on the front lines and I think will really give some insight into what's happening in our city and in our country. I'm so delighted to, I'm gonna call all of you up. That's a warning to you, Linda, yeah. <laughs> also, for those sitting on the floor, there are seats. Just, unless you want to be on the floor, and then that's fine. Uh, Linda Sarsour, Executive Director of Arab American Association of New York and Chief Organizer of the Women's March. Thank you. I'm sorry, Victoria, Carl, Murad, and Naeem. <laughs> um, so, um, Victoria Starrett, immigration attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to say something about Brooklyn Defender Services. They had, I don't know, you certainly had 15 lawyers on the ground at JFK the day after. The, yeah, so, thank you. Carl Lipscomb, Program Manager at the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. I want to say something. This is really important. Three out of the seven banned countries are African countries. And I think that we need to think about the intersection of racial injustice with immigrant injustice. And remember that there are all kinds of immigrants. And you can think about the injustices that everyone faces and you can certainly double it up probably for our brothers and sisters from Somalia and Sudan and Libya. So thank you, Carl. Carl. Murad Awade, Director of Political Engagement of the New York Immigration Coalition, one of our first emergency response grants. They've been organizing protests around the city and really carrying the weight of this movement building. Thank you so much, Murad. And last but not least, Naeem Islam, from, who's the Brooklyn community organizer for DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving. DRUM has been on the forefront of immigrant organizing for many, many years, and we really have a big round of applause for Naeem Islam. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a, just a softball question, and especially for Linda and Carl Naeem because you really are in the communities, you're really working directly with communities. How are people doing right now? What's the sense? Uh, sure. Yeah, come for, okay, cool. Um, so I think after the election, um, I think like many people here, folks in my community were caught off guard, right? There was a lot of anxiety, like what are we gonna do? Uh, so the day after the election, I woke up with a bunch of calls and messages of folks asking, what are we going to do? Uh, I didn't really have an answer for them because uh, as an undocumented person, I didn't know what I was going to do. So f for DRUM, uh, we really just like turned to our members and our community to figure out, okay, what do we need to do right now to 
protect everyone to keep people safe. Uh, one of the things is like we were expecting an increase in individual hate crimes, and there was an increase in individual hate crimes, but there was also going to be hateful policies that were going to be aimed at our communities. Um, you know, and instead of um, trying to combat the fear, the first thing we want to do is really create space for people to uh, address some of those emotions that they were having, uh, to really be able to feel scared, right? Because that's real. Um, but then from there, really figure out, okay, like how do we create local community uh, networks of defense? Um, for us, that became uh, what we're working on now, which is the hate-free zones. Uh, and that's an initiative um, of really like, okay, how do we create those infrastructures of defense? If we're not able to rely on the administration to protect our rights, uh, and we can only rely on local politicians to be able to do a certain amount, how do we really protect people? Um, so we are, I guess, creating kind of this like toolkit. So as DRUM, we're willing to do this work in the communities where we have a base, like in Queens, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, but really uh, creating this toolkit for people to use everywhere um, that shares resources on trainings for people to get, whether it's Know Your Rights or actual skill-based trainings uh, for bystander engagement, de-escalation, self-defense, uh, as well as really like building community relationships with local businesses or institutions uh, that are willing to leverage their power to protect communities and uphold the rights of, let's say, businesses, the immigrant workers that they employ or the immigrants that they serve, uh, as well as like faith-based institutions to come out and really like support the community and really build cross-community relationships to protect people. I think um, Naeem really summed it up, but um, people are horrified and people are afraid and people are um, being separated from their families. There are people, we, we forget that one of the countries in particular, Yemen, has been going through a war for the past few years and there has really not been much of an outcry uh, from the Saudi-led, US-funded uh, war against the Yemeni people. So these people have already been stranded in places like Djibouti. There already ha wasn't an American consulate that was working in a place like Yemen. And my organization, about 40% of our clientele are from Yemen. So just imagine people who are waiting um, in countries where they do not speak the language uh, for their visa applications and being told that their appointments are canceled and not knowing if you're going to be reunited with your children or with your spouse or with your parents. Um, I think the anxiety comes from a place of, you know, understanding our history as a country. We've done really horrible things to people before. Um, and we, I don't want to take you through um, four and a half centuries of pretty horrific things. And I think our community um, doesn't have the reassurance that something really horrible wouldn't happen to them. And, 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 I, and I mean Muslims of all backgrounds. And I think what this ban proved to all, and I think um, Cecilia said this, is that Muslims don't all look the same. They don't all look like me. They don't all look like Naeem. They don't all look like Carl. We literally represent every racial and ethnic national origin that you can imagine possible. So this idea of banning Muslims is really ludicrous, number one. But, um, but really you know, more ludicrous that Muslims have been here before this country was called the United States of America, but I won't get into the educational uh, moment. But um, I think what's the saddest to me is um, as someone who has, we have about 25 Syrian refugee families in Brooklyn. And when you hear stories of people who left torture and massacres and watched family members chopped up and brought to their doorsteps, um, people who are displaced and are living in horrific conditions in refugee camps across the world, and we live in a country that says we don't want Syrian refugees. We've only taken about 7,000 when other countries have taken in the millions. And then they actually come to you and say, before the ban even started when Donald Trump became president, they asked this really, like, can we go back? And I said, go back where? To the refugee camps. What? You just left the refugee camp, but they're so afraid of what could happen to them here that they're willing to take their families back to a refugee camp. Because you know what? At least they were together in the refugee camp. At least they were with community 
At least they felt that they could be physically protected in a refugee camp. And for me as a Brooklynite in particular, to, to, to live in Brooklyn and to have people who live with me in Brooklyn who don't believe that we as Brooklynites can protect them, that we, can't, that we won't stand for them, and that we won't make sure that nothing happens to them and their children really is something that has physically and emotionally impacted me personally. So I think what I want you to know is that your immigrant neighbors, your Muslim neighbors are horrified and afraid. And it comes from understanding that there were times in this country where the silent majority sat back and allowed us to exclude the Chinese. They allowed us to intern Japanese. They allowed for segregation. And that there were really racist things that happened in our country and we called it law. So let's remember this, that our government says certain things that happen are law. And I want to remind you in this room that just because something is law doesn't make it moral and doesn't make it just. So I don't want anyone telling me about what the law says or if the Supreme Court comes back. Because you know, you know Donald Trump is going to appeal. He's not going to take this line down. And if this goes up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agrees with Donald Trump, what they're going to tell you is this is the law. The question are you as Americans, are you going to stand for it because it's a law? Or are you going to stand up and say this is an immoral, unjust law? And finally get to a moment in our country where we do say never again, and when we say never again, we mean never again. Thanks, and um, you know, I agree with everything that was said, um, our communities, and uh, I think, um, you know, we organize and advocate on behalf of black immigrants, and um, many of you probably have never heard the term black immigrants, um, but uh, we consider them immigrants from Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere that are black. Um, and one of the reasons we exist is because when, uh, when immigration is covered as an issue, when um, Islamophobia is covered, um, the, it's rarely um, the face um, that we think of, the face that the media portrays, is rarely a black face. And um, this is a community that's um, invisibilized, both within the, the general narrative around immigration um, in our minds, um, but also within social movements that support immigrants and Muslims and even black people in the US. Um, and so the, our communities um, also, um, you know, our members have called us, many of them are afraid, but for different reasons. They're afraid that they're, you know, uh, the, the refugee ban um, has definitely affected many of them. They're afraid that additional countries will be added to the list of those banned. Um, but they're also afraid um, of the other executive orders that were signed. Um, the refugee ban has received a lot of coverage as it should have. Um, because it was put in place immediately. Um, the sanctuary cities uh, executive action has received a lot of coverage, the, the border wall. Um, but what hasn't received a lot of coverage is the dramatic expansion of, uh, of programs and practices that criminalize immigrants. Um, one of the executive orders called for ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, to prioritize deporting immigrants that are charged with an offense before they're even convicted. Um, and, uh, you know, never mind that many of the offenses were already minor offenses um, that we're leaning toward decriminalizing, such as possession of small amounts of uh, marijuana or turnstile hops um, or bootlegging CDs or DVDs, um, minor offenses that many of us, um, you know, don't believe should be criminal offenses. And, um, you know, to be frank, if uh, many of us in the room committed those acts, um, we wouldn't end up arrested. A police officer um, wouldn't stop us um, for purchasing or selling a DVD on the street. Um, so we represent black immigrants who tend to live in over-police communities and are victims of practices such as broken windows policing and stop and frisk which results in them experiencing the criminal justice system more often than other communities, and thus um, ending up uh, being deportable um, more so than other immigrant populations. Um, one thing I point out, black immigrants um, are, represent only 7% 
of the immigrant population in the US, but 20% of those in deportation proceedings um, because of criminal contact. Um, so our members have called us, you know, asking one, you know, uh, you know, expressing fears, but also asking who's going to advocate on behalf of us? Hundreds of thousands of people showed up to rallies and actions at airports over the weekend, but those same people wouldn't turn out if someone was facing deportation because they had a $5 bag of marijuana. Um, so that's, you know, that's what our communities are experiencing. Um, and they're, they're just afraid that resources aren't going to protecting um, immigrants, um, uh, immigrants like them. Thank you. Uh, so, Victoria and Murad, this is just a little bit about how JFK, the response to JFK came together. I guess, Victoria, I'll start with you. Can you provide a little bit of overview around Trump's EO, around the, the Muslim ban, like the legal standpoint? Of course, the wonderful news today changes that, but I think we'd still really like to hear what, what really is this about? How does it really impact immigrants? And then, Murad, what I would say after Victoria is, how, how did that come together at JFK? And, and really, what was um, New York City Immigration Coalition's role? Victoria? Sure. Um, so I think, I feel like the executive orders have been covered, I, I feel like in my life nonstop, so I could imagine in your life as well, um, but really have targeted seven countries who happen to not have business ties to someone. Um, and, you know, we have had, as other judges have pointed out, there are zero deaths related, terrorism related deaths to any, anyone from those countries. Um, there is very little talk about the refugee process. Um, you know, it, there's a talk about refugees are dangerous, um, but there's just a, a lack of knowledge about how long the process takes, how many state agencies do background checks. Um, I mean, we're talking, it takes years and every you know, government agency, security agency going through and doing background checks, and if there are any ties whatsoever, people are just not permitted to come into the United States because we are that strict. So the idea that refugees are dangerous is just not, um, not backed up by any facts. Um, alternative facts, Alternative perhaps. facts, right. Um, so I mean, what, what we saw was, was an, the immediate enforcement of an executive order um, that immediately people were inside planes coming with valid visas and suddenly the visas, their green cards, um, the permission to come into this country was suddenly revoked without any hearing, um, without any ability for a neutral magistrate to look at the case and decide, are you a danger to the United States? Should your visa, which you have gone years and years and through all these background checks, should it be suddenly be revoked? Um, based on this blanket executive order. And so what we saw at JFK were attorneys, I mean, people turned out, I think at 6 a.m., attorneys from my office started, and other offices, I think there were over 100 attorneys, law students, advocates who were at JFK, um, writing habeas petitions, advocating with CBP, standing with families, and just saying, we're here with you, and we're gonna be here um, with you for the next, hopefully, no more than four years. Can I, just a quick question, Mara, I'm so sorry. Um, are there still Brooklyn Defender attorneys at JFK? Are there still attorneys at JFK? Is this kind of an ongoing thing? Yes. So, so I personally know that some have been continuing to go. Um, I think there is a little less to do because um, now with all of these for stays, the it seems, yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank, thank you for the courts. Um, checks and balances actually working at this point um, and stopping these executive orders so that people are able to get through. Um, there was at a certain point applications being, you know, taken away from people who were in the country, um, you know, people who have been here 10, 20, 30 years applying for naturalization. Um, whose applications suddenly have gone into a different pile to not be considered, um, again, without any, um, any neutral magistrate taking a look and seeing if this is actually fair. But so yes, there, is, there are still attorneys going out. Murad, you wanna talk a little about the organizing side? I know you were behind the JFK, behind Battery Park. I'm sure there, there are many more. So thank you for having this event, first of all. Thank you to 
to the Brooklyn Community Foundation, who's been a pillar within this great borough. Um, how's everyone feeling tonight? Because I feel really excited about this uh, court decision, and I'm just feeling like we need to get our energies up. So the organizing actually didn't start when everyone, it wasn't like something spontaneous happened and we were like, oh my God. No, we, before the election even happened, the New York Immigration Coalition is like really intentional in the way that we plan out our advocacy. So prior to the election, not saying that we were favoring one over the other, but whatever, uh, <laughs> we created an action plan if let's just say Hillary Clinton had won or Donald Trump had won, based on what they were saying would be their policy agenda moving forward. And everyone's like, we shouldn't do one for Donald Trump. And I was like, we have to do it. This is what we need to do. We need to do it. We need to do it well. So everyone was super hype, thinking that, you know, that night wouldn't have turned out the way it did. And then, I think it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, everyone was just like, let's dust off our DJT plan and move it forward. So we sprucing it up. And what we had envisioned to do moving forward, and we continuously went back and forth internally as an organization, is how do we like our usual organizing isn't gonna work anymore. And we had to amp up. And the way that we were gonna amp it up wasn't through usual, just like, we're gonna plan a protest tomorrow, in two weeks, please come out and join us. We realized that things had to have happen, it needs to happen quickly and very, uh, it needed to be very tactful. Um, so prior to January 27th when the executive order was signed, we already knew it was coming down the pike. On January 14th, we launched the This Is Our New York campaign, um, which is pretty much how do we defend our New York as a New York state um, and ensure that whatever he does uh, nationally won't impact our folks in New York. Um, and that campaign launched and we had an action in DC, we had actions across the state in New York. Um, and then we started to build up because we started getting the rumors that the EO was coming down the pike. Um, and there were two EOs that we were generally concerned of, and I don't want to weigh one over the other, but the first one that he signed was for the border wall, which he didn't say how it was going to get paid for, as well as doubling Customs and Border Patrol, tripling ICE enforcement agents, and then uh, also there's like a couple other things which uh, are concerning, like depending on what you're doing or however you inhibit an ICE investigation, you will then be criminal, uh, you can be charged with a crime for doing that as well. Um, so we were very perplexed about that. Um, but then we were like, okay, let's build up the momentum because we know a lot more is coming down. We did a press conference to denounce that when it happened. Um, and then we continuously were building up towards having an event. Um, we realized that the event that we were planning happened to be on the same day that Care in New York was having an event. And we were like, let's take a step back Let's give them the day, and we'll just partner with them, which is what we did, and we held, uh, you know, in partnership, well, CARE was leading it, but in partnership with them, we held the 10,000 plus person rally at Washington Square Park. Um, after that, we were getting word that the EO was coming down. On Thursday, we had our federal reps, our state reps, our local reps come down. We had this huge press conference denouncing it and saying that no matter what he's gonna do, we're gonna challenge it whichever way we can. And then on Friday, the 27th, we had a Jum'ah prayer. And for folks who don't uh, know what Jum'ah prayer is, it's pretty much what Sunday church is for Christians and Catholics, uh, for Muslims. So on Friday, you come together as a community and you pray together. So we decided that uh, in partnership with Majlis al-Shura, the Islamic Leadership Council of Greater New York, that we were going to start doing these in, in public. Um, and where was the best place to do it? Right outside of 26 Federal Plaza. But there wasn't really space to do it on Broadway, so we did it on the backside at Foley Square. We had an enormous amount of people coming out just to support the event, and we were really excited about that. At 4.30 that day, uh, the Muslim ban was signed, and automatically we had anticipated sending some folks from our legal team to JFK, assess the situation, and go from there. Someone went on Friday and CBP was like super confused about everything. We were like, we're gonna come back on Saturday. Uh, our director of legal initiatives, Camille Mackler, and some of our other legal folks ended up going that morning and they indeed uh, confirmed what we had anticipated was gonna happen. And then all of our staff 
headed out to JFK that morning. Um, and what happened was we had already touched some of our members and our partners like, hey, if this does happen, we don't know what we are planning to do there per se because we're going to get thrown out of the airport. Um, but if we have enough people, they can't really push us out that far. Um, so protests started inside the terminal, and like we had anticipated, we got thrown out. Uh, but what, we, what had happened during this period of time was that every single press outlet was setting up shop in the parking lot. Um, so a couple of us went up and did pr uh, media availability, and uh, pretty much I did a call to action. And we had already prepped this so that when uh, it went live on TV, that our Facebook posts, Twitter posts were all like telling people, come out to JFK right now. Um, and then it went viral. Uh, the second we did the call to action, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, uh, New York One, NBC, everyone had carried it. And originally there was about 25 of us strong there. It turned out to be 100 strong, then 500 strong, then 2,000 strong. And then the numbers went over 10,000 and we were just like, this is kind of getting really crazy, but this is amazing right now. Um, but yeah, that's how the culmination happened before we got to JFK and you know that night was really beautiful um, for some of us we were there till like two three o'clock in the morning um, because we also had issues with CBP because they still didn't want to uh, let people out even with the with the order um, to the point where it was like what the hell is happening here like do we need to get federal marshals and then there was, that's a whole different story but yeah great thank you So uh, speaking of things getting crazy, but in a good way, uh, Linda, um, I'm going to turn it to you because, in fact, you were one of the chief organizers of the Women's March. Can you share uh, what that was like for you and what's coming next? So um, some f I'm going to do like heavy.com, five things you need to know. Uh, <laughs> First, first, I want to say four of uh, the four national co-chairs of the Women's March on Washington are all New Yorkers. Let's just get that straight. That's, that's important. Um, I was repping Brooklyn, but I'm also a New Yorker too. Um, so when the, um, you know, the idea of the Women's March on Washington really quickly, and it just shows you the potential of, of, of everyday people, right? Like, we, like we, people that were part of the National Coordinating Committee for the Women's March on Washington are like bakers, yoga teachers, artists, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating, tech for, people that work at tech firms, like normal everyday people, bank tellers, like this is just the, the what is remarkable about, remarkable about it is probably of the 30 people that were the original National Coordinating Committee, four of us were like organizers, like that professional like paid organizers, and that's what we do for a living. Everybody else was everyday normal people that you probably are standing behind in a deli getting a cup of coffee with. Um, and when the, the, day, the, day, the night of the elections, a uh, retired grandmother in Hawaii named Teresa Shook wrote on Facebook, I think we should march. That's it. That's all that happened. <laughs> and then the Facebook page, she woke up, and the poor old lady woke up in the morning and... <laughs> Her Facebook was like already on the other side of the country. Like that was really what happened. And, and then it culminated into a Facebook page that became the Million Women's March. And poor white ladies didn't know that in 1997 there was already a Million Women's March that was organized by black women in Philadelphia. So it was a little educational moment. Um, and then by, fr <laughs> that's what happened. Um, they were like, oh, thanks for telling us. Um, <laughs> And then by Friday, to give this, these fabulous white ladies some credit, is that by Friday, which was um, Veterans Day, uh, they had already decided um, that it was probably a good idea to find some women of color to organize with. Um, how did I get involved really quickly is all I did was go on the Facebook page, and I was like, oh, let me read the description. This looks really interesting. And I said, wow, what a great effort. Hope you can include some Muslims in Muslim communities. That's all I wrote. Then my status goes across the country, and then I get a call being like, want to be one of the national co-chairs of the Women's March on Washington? So beware when you comment on other people's stuff. <laughs> Just letting you know, that's what happened. Um, so I became the um, co-chair of the Women's March on Washington, and 
you know, I just want people to understand this is where the organizing kicks in and this is why we're in a different moment than we have ever been before. And I want to just give you insight onto how we are going to win together. And the Women's March on Washington taught me a lot of things. So my conditions for organizing were people of color had to be center that we had to center the most marginalized communities, that this could not be about women's reproductive rights, because if you're a woman about to de be deported to Colombia or to Mexico, your ovaries are probably not your first priority right now. Um, if you're a Muslim, you're worried about getting interned like the Japanese, you're probably not worried about your reproductive rights at that moment. Not to say that reproductive rights are not important, they're very important, but we could, and my condition was that we could talk about reproductive rights and racial justice and economic justice and immigrant rights and LGBTQI rights all at the same time. Because I have a big enough mind and a big enough heart that I can talk about all those things together, right? So we decided to then, for the Women's March, to become an intersectional, that we could give platform to climate justice and to racial justice and to all these issues and that it could be led by women. And that was the idea of the Women's March. And that's what happened. And the Women's March also gave me the opportunity to say, wait a minute, we have all these things we want to be against right now. We're in this like reactionary mode. Everybody wants to fight. It's either fight or flee, right? That's the kind of moments that we were in. And the Women's March was an opportunity for us to say, hold up a second. I'm not letting evil monsters in the White House blind me and blind us as Americans from what we truly believe in and what we believe our true values are as human beings and individuals. I'm actually gonna be part of something that talks about what I'm for and not just what I'm against. And that's what happened. And it's why we were able to bring out people who swore to God they never marched a day in their lives, literally. And you saw it here in New York City, you saw it in Washington, D.C. When I went to, when, when we were in Washington, D.C. and at four o'clock in the morning, we were already on the side of the march. And it was dark outside, it was literally like night. And I walked and I saw these people and I, went, I was literally talking to random people. I was like, what are you doing here? It's four o'clock in the morning. They were like, what are you doing here? We're doing what you're doing here. <laughs> and it was a remarkable feeling of how you can bring 1.2 million people in Washington, D.C., about 3.4 million nationally and close to 6 million internationally to stand up and say, we are going to be united and we're going to center the most marginalized communities and we're going to be able to talk about all the progressive issues on one platform together. And what I will say is what you saw from the branding of the Women's March, from a lot of people said, wow, this, you guys got a lot of resources behind this. I was the head of fundraising. That was my job. And, you know, when, when we started, the, just to give you the, the power of people and individuals, when we started organizing, they said, oh, Linda, you know, here's Corporation A, corp I said, hold up. Y'all don't know who you mess, no, nah, no. Nah. Ain't no corporation putting the name on this. Let me just let y'all know that. They say, what do you mean? We can't put something this huge together without support from corporations. I said, y'all weren't following one of those political campaigns that I was on in 2016. Yes, you can. Yes, we can. And the Women's March on Washington was powered by the people. It was, I would say, 70% of the funding that we got was crowdsourced. It was like the $27 donations. It was from every corner of this country, from rural Nebraska to our friends in LA to the mom in Brooklyn. So we raised about close to four and a half million dollars. And I'm gonna be honest with you because this was public information. We used merchandise stores for people to buy t-shirts and be able to support the march and come and wear our branding but also have their proceeds go to the march. So the reason why I tell you that is because when you got to the Women's March on Washington, there was no Coca-Cola there was no Walmart. There was no brands that owned the message. And we were, allowed, we were able to put up whoever we wanted on that stage. We were able to talk about whatever we wanted on that stage. We, were, we, we put the undocumented. We put black women. We put native people. We, we talked about climate justice. We were able to talk in such a free way and organize in such a free way that I think that's what, that's what we've been missing for a long time. Even foundations. like. It's funny because the right wing has been attacking me for, I mean, they've been attacking me for like 15 years, but lately they got really creative about it. And the question they're always are asking me, they're always like, 
Tan, 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 George Soros. I was like, George Soros is a nice guy. He, he gives us, you know, he supports a lot of the organizations. But guess what? Ain't not a dollar from George Soros went on the Women's March on Washington, just so you all know. So I think what's important is that the Women's March proved to me the potential of ordinary people, the mom. I don't know if you saw Bob Bland, who's one of the national co-chairs, is a, the CEO and president of Manufacturer New York, which does ethical manufacturing. She was one of the co-chairs. Chloe, who you see, who's what we call our March baby, was born during the planning of the March. So literally, this lady was delivering in the hospital. And we were like, okay, do we do Chase Manhattan Bank? Or do we want to do a credit union while the lady's delivering her baby in a hospital? And she kept her baby with her everywhere. She carried her baby around. She breastfed her baby. And I know it sounds like too much information, but it proved to me that anybody, any Brooklynite, any New Yorker, that there should be no impediment for anyone to say, I don't have a role to play or I can't play. Because if a woman that just delivered a baby could breastfeed her baby and organize the largest protests in US history, then darn it, you could do something. So, and I just, and I wanna be clear that the Women's March on Washington is not here to replace any institutions. We were a group of women that came together from across the country, and the idea was that after this administration, and people said, why the first day after, why, why the first day, why not? two weeks later, why not wait and see what other bad things are about to happen? No, that has to happen on the brother's first day in office that he needed to see at least 3.4 million people nationally. And I heard, I don't know if somebody wants to look this up, but I heard if you can turn out 3.4 million people, that's what, almost 1% of the US population? It's a lot of power right there. I won't say what, what it says online that means because then it will get into a newspaper somewhere, but it's pretty powerful. And I think that set the impetus for the rest of what you're seeing now, this consistent mobilizing at airports around the country, the direct actions, that it really gave and inspired people and gave a spirit of people of organizing in this consistent way. The Women's March on Washington, by the way, is alive and breathing. And there's a lot more work coming, including a day without a woman. There will be a international strike um, that will be led by women. March 8th. They're also, huh? It's gonna be March 8th, because that would make sense, wouldn't it? Um, this, the, the other piece, just so people know where, where we're, because people are saying, what happened and what are we doing? Right now, we're working on an electoral strategy for 2018. Um, and it's going to include state legislators specifically, as well as on the federal level. And we know for a fact, and you say that you were at the Brooklyn Community Foundation event at the Brooklyn Museum, that in 2018, Linda Starr Sewer said on this stage, that we will win back one branch of government and it's going to happen and it's going to be led by women in this country and it's a guaranteed because the strategy is so universal. I mean, we're organizing with women in rural towns to city girls like me from Brooklyn. I mean, the remarkable unity that is bringing people across this country together in a way that I haven't seen at least in my 16 years of organizing and women who are older than us that are organizing with us have told us they've never seen anything like it. I was on um, MSNBC with Gloria Steinem and Chris um, Hayes said, you know, you've been here before, you've been doing this for decades and she literally interrupts him. She's like, shh, hold on. She's like, I never seen anything like this. So if Gloria Steinem says she's never seen anything like this, well, we're probably doing something right. I'm going to hold you to that on, in 2018, Linda. I'm going to call you up after Election Day. All right. Um, Victoria, sanctuary cities. So we hear that term all the time. Um, I, I, I don't even know how many sanctuary cities. I know that New York City is one, uh, but I don't even know how many there are around the country. Uh, so what does it mean to be a sanctuary city? And I think particularly for New York, you know, what is the relationship between NYPD and ICE? Um, you know, and city policy versus law enforcement, and of course, local policy versus federal policy. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, so we generally don't like the word sanctuary city because it, is, it has been very politicized, and I think essentially what it boils down to is we're holding the federal government to, uh, to honor our constitutional rights. Right, so ICE, what ICE wants to do is they want to give a piece of paper to jails and say, 
hold this person, hold this person for 48 hours, for 72 hours, based on nothing than an allegation that they are a non-citizen and they might be deportable. A number of those detainers have been against US citizens a number of times, so the same person has gotten uh, detained in jail a couple of times because ICE doesn't correct their own computers. Um, so what that means, and all that cost is borne by taxpayers because it's all, uh, the jails all have to pay the cost of feeding and housing those individuals. The federal so government local, So it's a local cost. That's correct. For this federal policy to hold people for ICE. Correct. Okay. Who then they might, you know, I've definitely had clients who go to, to ICE and then they get released. So now the local jail has held someone for five days, borne that cost, and then ICE decides to release them anyway. Um, the other thing is that they're, they're requesting that people hold them sometimes when there's no conviction, right? And I think this is one of the dangerous things that is in one of the executive orders. Uh, unfortunately, President Obama you know, deported a lot of people. He created this idea of felons not families as if felons don't have families, as if they're not part of our communities. He expanded this idea of criminal aliens, created and really reinforced this idea of a good immigrant, bad immigrant, and that we need to get rid of bad immigrants. Um, at Brooklyn Defenders, obviously, we are representing those bad immigrants, right? These are people who are being accused of things, um, and ICE wants to, now, they are priorities, right? So that means that immigration is using its resources to locate, to arrest, to detain, and potentially to deport individuals, not only who have been charged, so again, presumed innocent, not convicted of anything, but simply charged with something, or, I love this, this piece, I don't even know how it's gonna get enforced, but they have, they have committed an act that is a chargeable offense. So they have, been not they have not been charged with anything, but an immigration officer is gonna determine that they have committed a crime under state law. So that's, that's one of the most dangerous things, I think, under the executive order, that essentially being a non-citizen is a criminal act. Um, and I think it's something that we all need to, to fight back against. I think one of the things that Brooklyn Defenders has been doing and will continue to do is to in, uh, work against uh, this broken windows policing, which the acting DA of Brooklyn has said doesn't work, right? We are arresting people. The number one charge in Brooklyn, turnstile jumping. Also a deportable offense. I have a client who was detained for eight months in immigration detention, he had an immigration order against him, almost got deported. Luckily, an attorney was able to do a motion to reopen. I ordered the minutes years later, so this has gone on years later, ordered the minutes. He was not even convicted of turnstile jumping. So he was in jail, almost deported for, turns, for turnstile jumping when actually he wasn't even convicted of that. And that's, that's the system that has been set up, and this is the system that these, um, Immigration officers, that's why it's so important that we have neutral magistrates, right? That we need someone to be a check on, on immigration officers who are willing to just arrest, detain, and quickly deport people. Um, and I think the other point that I wanna make that I think is really important is every time someone gets arrested, they give their fingerprints over, right? Everyone knows this, you get a mugshot, you get your fingerprints. Those fingerprints get sent to a system that ICE then has access to. So now ICE has their address, and they potentially know that they're in jail. They, and they find out different information from them. And what are they doing with that information? They're showing up at people's houses, they're showing up to homeless shelters, and arresting and detaining people, including people who are so sick that they cannot sit down, people who are having consistent heart attacks every single time they go to court because of the, the stress that they're under, and, and ICE is fighting any requests to release those people. So just, um, and, and Carl, I think this is a good segue too, to, to your work, um, particularly what you said in terms of percentages and the particular victimization of black immigrants. But just, I just want to be very clear. So technically, with a sanctuary city, does NYP, is NYPD taking its orders from this sanctuary city? You know, is it saying, no, we will not? detain this person for ICE or not? 
meaning is, it, is the NYPD obligated to hold that person for ICE in New York City? No, they're not obligated. Um, but they do have policies where they are holding people and they are turning people over to ICE. We have stronger policies with the courts, uh, which do require a judge to review evidence that the person actually is a non-citizen, that the person actually is deportable, meaning that the government can deport them in order to turn them over to, to transfer custody. Um, okay. But for NYPD, it's, it's different, but it is not mandatory okay. because the federal government cannot I just want to be clear, the federal government cannot mandate that because that is a federal duty and the local government does, is not required to um, act for the federal government. Okay. okay. Carl, do you want to comment on all of this and just in terms of your work with black immigrants? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say is I know that New York City considers itself a sanctuary city, but New York, and you know, listen to this carefully, New York is not a sanctuary city. It's not a sanctuary city. When I think of the word sanctuary, I think of a, a place where people are, you know, are able to live freely, where they are able to, you know, live in dignity, where they're able to pursue economic opportunities and educational opportunities and have access to health care without fear of, um, of state violence, of state sanctioned violence, of being arrested just for walking down the street, um, or of being deported. Um, more specifically, I say New York is not a sanctuary city because though the NYPD um, and the Department of Corrections doesn't cooperate with ICE, um, our school system isn't barred from cooperating with ICE. Our hospitals aren't barred from cooperating with ICE. Um, private businesses um, co um, at times have cooperated with immigration officials. Um, just this week, um, and I'm not a parent, but one of our members passed along a note that came um, in her daughter's book bag from the Department of Education saying, if ICE comes to the school, um, refer them to the principal. And the note indicated, we, you know, we respect the rights of all immigrants, yada, yada, yada. If ICE comes, refer them to the principal. Now this, you know, if you just scan this, this is like, yes, the DOE is doing its part. But uh, what that says is, if ICE comes, let them in and bring them to the principal. And so there's no guarantee that students um, won't be pulled out of their classrooms and end up in deportation proceedings, and young people can be deported for offenses like throwing an orange at a teacher, which is considered assault. Um, so I think, you know, I think we should keep that in mind. And it's, it's hard because New York City in many ways um, is a bubble, <clears throat> um, and uh, the rhetoric um, coming from the city and coming from elected officials is we, you know, we are all New York, we welcome all immigrants, but New York is not a sanctuary. Um, the, the word sanctuary by definition does not apply to New York. Um, when it comes to black immigrants, and like I said before, black immigrants face, especially black Muslim immigrants, face the consequences of their race, their religion, and their migration status. So like all black people in the city, they, they fear being arrested, um, being stopped by police, um, just, just for living in their communities. Like Muslim immigrants, they are targeted um, by the NYPD. They're, you know, they go to mosques that have been victims of uh, NYPD surveillance. Um, increasingly, the face of quote-unquote terrorists that we see in the media is that of a Somali immigrant or, some other, of, or another black immigrant. Um, and then again, um, when it comes to their immigration status, um, while for now, um, you know, the, the Muslim ban is halted, um, and so refugees from certain countries are protected, millions of immigrants are still at risk of deportation um, in this city and across the country. And so that's something, and I hate to be the Debbie Downer on the, on the panel, I swear I'm normally a very optimistic person, but I don't, you know, I don't want us to leave here celebrating the, you know, uh, celebrating as though the Muslim ban um, has been halted, so everything's okay because it's not okay. So, yeah, I totally agree with that around New York not being a sanctuary, right? And what we found is that after the election, as uh, you know, the mayor was coming out promising sanctuary. That was kind of dangerous because a lot of folks believed that. They're like, okay, we're safe in New York. 
nothing's going to happen, and that's not true. Uh, and how can you promise sanctuary under broken windows that are criminalizing black and brown and immigrant Forever. communities, right? You cannot say, I'm going to protect you and then criminalize you. It just doesn't work. Uh, as well as the whole notion of sanctuary just can't be for immigrants, right? Sanctuary has to be for everyone. Sanctuary has to be for immigrants, for black folks, for queer and trans folks, for women, for young folks, for everyone, right. right? And as like, as an undocumented Muslim person, if sanctuary is only offered to me and not, let's say, uh, to black folks or to Latino folks or to criminals, that's not sanctuary I want. Folks with criminal convictions are the first to go and are always left out of the conversation, right? With the whole narrative of families, not felons. Felons have families too, That's right. right? And just because you've committed a crime doesn't mean you should be separated from your family or you shouldn't deserve the certain amount of right, right? So having a piece of paper, whether that's your green card or citizenship, does, should not qualify you for your rights. And neither should being American, right? I don't identify as Asian American or Bengali American. I don't identify as American. One of the reasons is coming here post 9-11, that was something I was never allowed to do. But two, it's, it, um, it's always been the narrative of like, okay, when you're American, when you get your papers, you can do this, you can do that, you can do that. I don't want a piece of paper to justify myself as a person. I just wanted to add that um, I always get, I don't know, it just never sits right with me when we allow government to be the ones who define what sanctuary city is. I think it is us who create sanctuary cities. It's people who create sanctuary. And I think oftentimes the conversation has been about uh, sanctuary basically, I don't know, at least what I, my understanding is when people say sanctuary, meaning like in these government policy conversations, they mean that the local city government is not going to work with the federal government. That's really like the definition of sanctuary. But is that in fact enough? And to Naeem's point and to Carl's point in particular about broken windows policing, that's not seen necessarily as a policy that impacts black and brown people in the way that black and brown people see it. So my point is, is that I want to define what sanctuary is. I want you to define what sanctuary is. And I always say to people, how are we going to protect the most vulnerable amongst us if we don't even know who our neighbors are? And I always say, you can't protect people that you don't know. And when I, when I think about sanctuary communities, I think about canvassing, I think about on an individual level, like on my street, like knocking on people's door and being like, by the way, my name is Linda and I live up the street from you, you know? just to get to know, like people literally tell me they don't know who lives down the hall from them in their buildings, right? They don't know who their next door neighbors are. So if you don't know that I'm your neighbor and God forbid there comes a day where local undocumented neighbors are being rounded up, how are you supposed to just jump out of nowhere and be like, not my neighbor. I've got, like you don't even know those people for you to stand out and defend them. And I think what I'm hoping that people realize is the power of us as individuals, that if you know there's someone in your community who is an immigrant, is new here, maybe English is not their first language, you probably are not going to go up to them and be like, yo, Naeem, are you undocumented? But maybe you have a... Don't ask that. Yeah, don't ask that. Don't ask that. <laughs> don't ask that. But being able, like, in my, in my neighborhood where I live in South Brooklyn, um, in, in Bay Ridge, like... You know, there's a lot of a very large Latino community in our neighborhood. There's a, obviously a very large Muslim community in, in, our, in our neighborhood. There's a, a very up and coming Asian community who's coming out from the, you know, Sunset Park area into our area. And my thing is always like, I, I, I talk to everybody. And I don't, I'm not, I'm just going to be like, hey, good morning, good afternoon, how are you doing? If you're on my street, if I see that you send your kids to the same schools that, that I send my kids to, or if I see you on the bus stop every morning when I'm going to work, that must mean you are my neighbor. I think that's the virtue that we don't have as New Yorkers, right? New Yorkers, we're always walking straight from your house to the train station, you're getting to work, you get your cup of coffee in the morning. That's not how do you create a sanctuary community. And so, I'm, so even if on an individual level we can do that. And I will say something really powerful that just happened recently around when we're talking about organizing. As someone who's a daughter of a small business owner in New York City, a bodega owner, is man, those Yemeni bodega owners, my people, man. I mean, I, 
you know, watching immigrants, many of whom English is not their first language, some of whom have been here for decades, other newer than that, who decided and said, hold up a second, New York City. Let me show you who we are and what we have power. And for many people who know bodega owners, right, they are like, right now, it was snowing this morning. You better believe that Yemeni bodega owner was open. He was not messing around. You, these people are in our communities. They are part of our communities. They come and invest their money in our local communities, and they come and open these businesses. And those very people who you get your cup of coffee or when you forget your wallet at home, they're like, don't worry, we got you. Come back tomorrow. Are the very people whose families were banning from coming here. And so watching the organizing of immigrant communities in particular, and immigrant-led organizing, has been super inspiring um, for me personally as a born and raised Brooklynite and also as a daughter of a bodega owner. So I think that's the kind of organizing that we need and the organizing that needs to be pr kind of fueled by their fellow New Yorkers. So I'll give you an example of something that people did in Brooklyn that I thought was amazing. So they did this campaign the, the few days after the that weekend after, so which was last weekend, where people said, you know what, on Saturday, if you were going to Costco or Whole Foods, maybe you'll take a, maybe you won't go to do that your shopping. Maybe you'll just go to the bodega, and instead of spending that $2 on a cup of coffee and a newspaper, maybe you just spend $20 that day at your local bodega. So to help people regain some of the money that they lost during the bodega strike for the past eight hours. That was some ordinary people that were like, that's what we want to do. So again, Yes, it's the institutional organizing is important, but the powerful organizing is happening by everyday New Yorkers in the city who are coming and showing up at JFK, who are organizing locally with bodega owners. And the third thing that I've been seeing in Brooklyn in particular is bystander intervention trainings, right? Naeem talked about an increase in hate crimes, and oftentimes when hate crimes happen, New York City, there really isn't a place where you're walking down any street where there ain't no people around, I'm sorry. Like, we don't live in the rural, like, you know, forest. Like, there's all, these things always happen with other people around. But oftentimes, people don't know how to intervene in these situations. So when you talk about sanctuary communities, it means that I can feel confident that I can walk in the streets of Brooklyn and that my fellow New Yorkers and my fellow Brooklynites are going to find different ways to intervene as we should be intervening in sexual harassment or street harassment cases. So if you're interested, um, the Center for Anti-Violence Education, which is also Brooklyn-based, you know, my organization, the Arab American Association of New York, we have some resources that we put together through some local donors and some foundations. We've been doing bystander intervention trainings actually across the city after something really amazing happened. Two sisters in Harlem called us up and said, do you know anyone who can take the train with us from the 125th Street train station? They were Muslim, young sisters in hijab. At this time, they don't need anyone to do anything extra. They just wanted people to accompany them on the same train ride, right? So we just put up a Google Doc and said, hey, anybody in Harlem takes this train route in the evenings? Next thing you know, 8,900 people across New York City were like, we're interested in this. If there are other people in other parts of the city, this is the neighborhoods we live in, this is our zip code, we would be happy to take trains with people, we would be happy to walk people to school in the mornings, here's the time. So my uh, previous deputy director who actually left being a deputy director just so we could make her do this full time, her name is Kayla Santososo, and she, Kayla. So anyway, my point is, is that's the power of ordinary people that said, look, I may not be a full-time organizer, I may not work at the Brooklyn Defenders or at Baji or at Drum or at the New York Immigration Coalition, but I want to accompany people so they can feel safe going to school or going to take their kids to school in the morning. So again, I want you to leave here understanding your own personal p potential and understanding your responsibility when the mayor of New York City stands up and says, we're a sanctuary city. That doesn't give me solace. What gives me solace is when my neighbors say that my community is a sanctuary community. So the, the mayor, the, the mayor that the, what the mayor says and the comptroller and the public advocacy is cute, but they're not the ones that are gonna intervene in our communities if there are raids in our community, if there are people picked up in our communities, if there are women being harassed walking down the street. It is you who are going to be those buffers and those people who are gonna protect the most vulnerable amongst us.
I think that's a, a great place to uh, not end, because we're delighted to, to field questions from the audience, but, um, you know, I'm, I love that the natural curve of this conversation has gone from really understanding fear and anxiety um, being suffered by individuals and by our neighbors, our Brooklynites and our, our New Yorkers, um, to the power of individuals and communities to change hate and to change fear and to change anxiety. And I hope that that's an inspiration to everybody here um, that in large parts or in small parts, you really can change what's happening. Um, and I would encourage you all to support the phenomenal organizations to my right. They really are doing incredible work. And actually, there are a lot of great immigrant organizations and non-immigrant organizations in Brooklyn doing great work. I certainly would encourage you to go to our website, Brooklyn Community Foundation, and support the organizations listed there. We stand by them. Um, Center for Anti-Violence as well. Um, and in fact, our action fund does fund bystander training. So if organizations are interested in doing more bystander training, we can support those efforts. So, I certainly would like to say that I think you've helped bring this around to a sense of hope uh, that we all have the power in us to bring about change. So I would love to, so thank you all to our phenomenal. Thank you. So I'd love to open it up to questions. I'm, first of all, I just want to say that I, you know, now I'm actually looking at the audience. Um, I feel like the size of it has just doubled, and so I'm just really gratified that everybody has come in this crazy night. Thank you so much. Um, so if anyone has questions, please just stand up. Oh, there is, there are mics there, I guess get in line or speak loudly. Um, and yes, they're in line. Great. Go ahead. I just want to thank everyone. Um, and so I'm a journalist, and after the election, and particularly after the inauguration, there was um, there's a call for a lot of organizations I'm a part of to invest more heavily in Muslim stories, articles, and media on Muslim communities that are underrepresented. Um, so my question to all of you is, what stories do you feel that are in your communities that are not being talked about, that are not being represented in the media? Thank you, great question. Any, anybody here want to take that? Go. Go for it. Um, so yeah, recently there has been a lot of attention on uh, Muslim refugees, right? Uh, but those are folks that are able to, uh, you know, get through that process. There are a lot of folks who, uh, let's say from South Asian countries, um, who aren't able to go through a refugee process or aren't even granted visas, right? Um, who end up having to uh, come to, let's say they will go from Bangladesh to Brazil and then spend upwards of six months walking across South and Central America to come to the US-Mexico border and cross over, uh, which is uh, like the majority of the base that I work with in Kensington, Brooklyn. Uh, a lot of young men, some young as 17, who make that trek to come here, uh, many of whom fleeing um, economic hardships and a lot uh, fleeing political violence, right? We say there's a Muslim ban, but the amount of visas that are granted to certain communities or certain countries, that's like a soft ban in itself. The reason so many people are willing to take such an extreme journey is because they're not granted those visas. And in fact, uh, the political parties that they are a part of that are being targeted back home are then identified as terrorist organizations by the US government, right? So there is a lot beyond just what's popular right now, and not just within Muslim communities, but within, um, like one example I'll use is last night, one of the first people to be deported from uh, Trump's administration, um, Guadalupe Reyes, right? A mother of two, been in this country for over 20 years, only offense that she had was she was issued a deportation order. And I used that deportation order to track her down and deport her. So there, as 
raids and uh, detentions and deportations in case, we're gonna see a lot more of these stories, but a lot of them are gonna fall through the cracks and aren't gonna get the attention and aren't gonna get people uh, you know, calling up their reps to demand for their release. Can I just, um, I know one question um, that people have just about that particular example is when a caregiver or a mother is deported but has children here who are American citizens, what is the legal, you know, what are the legal intricacies of that situation and is there any kind of compassion for a situation like that, maybe Victoria, that is a question for you, but maybe any of you, Linda, or any of you know what the answer is. So it used to be there was a, something called prosecutorial discretion that ICE had the authority to issue, and it would often is cases where someone has been here for a really long time, they either have zero criminal convictions or really minor offenses, um, and then they're often caregivers, and ICE just takes the, used to take the position that it wasn't worth it and Maybe they had a little bit of a heart to actually keep people here. Um, I think now it is up to the parent of what happens to that to those children. So sometimes the children are forced are deported with the parent. Um, they are forced to go back to that country, or they can enter our foster care system or stay with family. I mean, but it's really if they're, a, and they're American citizens. And they're American citizens. Right. Yeah. Murad, did you want to answer the other question? Or? Yeah, I think um, the narrative around like the Muslim community has been spun out since 2001 as kind of like this community that's been silent here for a very long time. And I think one piece of uh, the actual narrative that's been ignored for a really long time is that the Muslim community has not been silent. The Muslim community has been organized within their communities as an Arab American Muslim. Um, I've seen my community morph into a really fierce uh, resistance. And it's not just been in this past week, it's been in this past 15 years that we've had to endure uh, mass surveillance from law enforcement, from the NYPD, the FBI, making sure that people in our neighborhoods and our communities aren't really getting played uh, by law enforcement, but also that when we're talking about the Muslim community, I think a lot of folks, and uh, Carl and Linda were, and Naeem were referencing this, is that we aren't just a, you know, one person, you know, the Muslim community spans the entire spectrum. And when we're talking about it, we have various stories. And I think the media tends to highlight the hot topic at the time. Um, and that hot topic right now is the Muslim ban. Um, but before that, we were, you know, up until the AP broke the story where, uh, you know, Linda was really critical in that where, you know, we had always figured we're under surveillance. But then when we actually had hard evidence showing that we were indeed being surveilled by the NYPD, it was kind of like, what the F? This is, like we knew it in the back of our heads, but it, we needed like something to verify it for us. Um, so I think like highlighting those stories, also there's been a ton of stories that have been ignored by the media of people being entrapped by law enforcement and being like forced into these situations where, you know, if they're a young person getting amped up by uh, an informant to do some dumb shit, sorry, um, <laughs> and then getting literally locked up for it, um, and now they will rot in prison. So those stories are really critical. Um, and the Muslim community isn't just one person. That's what I want to end it on. Um, we are as diverse as everyone up here and in the room. Um, and I think that that's something that needs to continue to be told um, because a large portion of the Muslim community is African American. Um, and that story is never really told. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, first of all, for coming to speak. Um, I get the sense that a lot of what is being talked about in terms of planning for the next four years is a mode of self-defense, right? A lot of what we're talking about is, a, is about defense. Um, but my question is about the long term. Like, what got us in this place in the, in the first place, right? Like, what kind of political system and economic system got us to this point? So my question is, and I hear you talking about self-organizing communities. I hear you talking about, you know, uh, not wanting a, a government to decide whether you're illegal or illegal. 
So my question is for all of you, what are some of the long-term changes that you hope for? What kind of, like, is this constitution working for you? Is, for any of us, right? Is this, sorry? Is the electoral college working for you? Thank you. <laughs> is, is the political and economic system working? And if it's not, what are we gonna do about it? I mean, I'm interested in this platform that you mentioned, but I somehow doubt that taking over a branch of the government is going to be enough because it's this system, this government, that got us to this place. So, thank you. Capitalism, anyone? Um, that's the, I think the winning one branch of government back for me is a short term, right? That's not part of my long term strategy. I think it's, it's what we need right now as part of the self kind of defense mode that we are in to put checks on what's happening in the interim. Um, look, we got to get out of this two party system. Call me crazy, right? Like, I understand that. Like, I know that. We, we are one of the one of few countries around the world, you know, quote, democracies who are still in a two party system, like duopoly, like that's who we are. And we are going to keep going back to the lesser of two evils. I really believe this election, we weren't doing the lesser of two evils. It was pretty obvious to me that there was fascism and not fascism, but that was just me. Um, but but we, we keep going back into the cycle. And the reason why we're in the situation that we're in, I think capitalism is, is, is a problem. Um, and I think that it, people have been talking about this and everyone who's been talking about capitalism for the past you know, de couple of decades are the radical fringes you know, crazy, but guess what? We're like getting to become the like mainstream now. We mainstreaming that socialism or democratic socialism is coming into them. Like there's a lot of language that, the reason why I'm optimistic is a lot of the viewpoints that we're seeing really, really to the, to the left, almost falling off the spectrum, are becoming a little more to the center left right now. Like we're moving and creeping along and getting into a little bit of more of the mainstream. And I think that it, 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 young people, I think young people are like, we don't got loyalties to no political parties, right? I don't give a damn about any political party. I, my loyalties are with the people that I organize with, with the communities that I come from. So I think for the long, we gotta be short term, long term. In the interim, we gotta protect our people. Like that's just facts right now. Like people in our communities are in imminent danger, so let's protect the people. So let's not ignore that there are some short term things that don't seem really radical that we gotta do to protect our people. In the, in the long term, I think that we do need to crush the two party system. Like it's just not working for us, right? And I think that we are now in a situation where we have proven that that might be the next kind of and, and, and don't hate me, Brooklyn. I don't mean the Green Party. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm saying, like, that, like I want people to be clear that when we say not the two-party system, I don't mean Green Party. And I'm not saying that Green Party shouldn't be on the slate, but I'm saying that we need a party that centers the most marginalized communities, that puts it into factor that the demographics of our country are changing. In 25 to 30 years, we will be a min majority minority country, so the, the parties that we are going to create have to reflect that, reflect our values as people of different backgrounds and different values and different principles that we, we bring. So we need to be looking short term and, and long term. Long term is waking up the silent majority. To Murad's point, the Muslims been banned before. This is not the first time. Number two, we were already registered in a system Right here in New York City, where 26 Federal Plaza, you had men around the corner sleeping outside in March when it was freezing outside. It was like 15 degrees. There were at least 1,500 Pakistani men in Coney Island Avenue who disappeared off the face of the earth. Where were our fellow New Yorkers when that happened? You know what I mean? So I want you to know that a lot of the things that people are so outraged about right now already happened on our watch. They were not, I mean, they weren't happening on Naeem's watch or my watch or these folks' watch or their organization because these people were working back in those days. But we are in a moment right now where people are awakened, and I know you're going to think I'm crazy for saying this, but Donald Trump and his people and fascists may be a blessing in disguise because I have never seen people so woke in my life in the past. Like Some of us were forced to be woke because we were awoken by the evils of, of uh, both of our government and some of our fellow Americans. Like We were forced into it, but now everyone else joined in. So I'm, the question for me is, what are people willing to risk right now? And that's the real question of long-term organizing. In order to 
crash a two-party system, you gotta take risks. And I also wanna point out one last thing also when we think about organizing. We gotta protect the people who are on the front lines, right? Because the people on the front lines right now, we're getting tore the hell up by the right wing. The right wing is so coordinated and organized, delig delegitimizing those on the front lines, Black Lives Matter activists, Black Lives Matter leaders, Muslim organizers and Muslim leaders, you know, uh, the, the alternative facts that you're talking about. Those same media outlets that engage in fake news and alternative facts, guess what? They got White House press credentials. Like, we have to understand that we are under fascism already. It's not coming or we're not trying to prevent it, it's here. The question is what kind of long-term organizing do we need that is revolutionary, re revolutionary, that is radical, and I don't mean radical like the kind of word that the government uses radical, because that's why we are all being criminalized because we're radical. I'm talking about true radical organizing that gets to the root of the problem. And the question that you have to ask yourself to look at long-term organizing is what are you willing to give up? You know how much stuff our community gives up every day we have to worry about? I just was out of the country. I didn't even post a picture from being out of the country because I didn't want the U.S. government to know I was out of the country because I was trying not to get banned from coming back into the country. Like, why do I even have to think about that as an American citizen who actually carries no other nationality or at least a, a piece of paper other than an American passport? The question is, what are you willing to do that makes you uncomfortable? The Women's March on Washington, let's be real, people. I'm going to put it out there as a national organizer. That shit wasn't uncomfortable. That was on Saturday. It was cute. You wore your pink hat. We were all together, and it was great. But it, you really didn't give up much coming to the Women's March on Washington. So what are you willing to give up for the long term? Could I, could I just jump in on that as well? Um, I think Linda did an amazing job so, like talking about the... Re the reality we're in politically. I think um, if we, you look at who voted for who, even in Brooklyn, you would have seen that some folks have voted for this man. Um, and I think this is a, a conversation piece that is very uncomfortable to have with people, especially as a Palestinian American Muslim guy trying to have this conversation with some of the folks who I think might have voted for him, not passing any judgment. But let's be real, I think that racism is Really, it's it's become normalized more so than even I've ever seen it before, and I'm only like 30 years old. So maybe you know, flashback to the 60s. Um, but the reality that we're in right now is that people need to have hard conversations with their, and specifically white folks need to have hard conversations within their community, um, because the more that we keep talking about, like, how did we get here? Homeboy campaigned for a year on blatant racist shit and Islamophobic, xenophobic, like bigotry across the board. Like he did not spare anyone. You were Latino, you got it. You were Muslim, you got it. Like he did not leave anyone who was not white alone. And that has riled up the hate in this country. And I think that one piece that we have to have is not just the political angle, but like the community angle. And how do we build that up with the intention of actually changing hearts and minds as opposed to just winning elections. And that's the hard piece because we're in New York City. We can change a couple of folks' minds, but I think that this is a conversation, and this is what I've been telling gentrifiers, is that maybe you might want to go back to the Midwest where you came from and actually start organizing in the communities you left so that you can get your people woke, as woke as you are, um, but that's just a thought. Um, and then, and, and really, we have to, every time, it, it's not just doing a, you know, the bystander training stuff is really important, but it's not just that, because when, you, when we see these microaggressions, we see them all the time, and no one really says anything about them. Um, in the workplace, in the train, at a library, at school, in this museum. Like, we just need to be cognizant and aware that we have to call that shit out. And if we continue to like, just be like, ah, that's not what they meant, or actually look at and, and start looking at what privilege is doing within our communities, then I think that that is, plus the political angle, but that is where, how we start changing the situation we're in so that we never get back here. Yeah, this is very hard to follow, but I think that, um, you know, I think long term beyond looking at how we center um, communities that are most oppressed within political parties. Um, I, you know, uh, 
I'm of the belief that I, you know, I would never rely on a political party to, you know, to affect change. I think that we have to center those that are most oppressed within our government and within our society. Um, there's never going to be a political party that completely aligns with all of our values. Um, and so I wouldn't put, I, I wouldn't put my trust in the two or three or multi-party system or in specific political leaders um, in order to fight for me. Um, I have to fight for myself and our communities have to fight for themselves. Um, the second point I just raise is, I think, you know, we, uh, everyone's shocked by the election and shocked that Donald Trump is our president. But I think Donald Trump or someone in Donald Trump's vein was a long time coming. This was, if there wasn't Donald Trump last year, there would be someone like him on the horizon. Um, and largely, I think it's because there's an undercurrent that, um, you know, that has ignored the fact that racism still exists in our country and xenophobia. Um, if we look at who's being attacked, um, you know, it's Muslim people, it's immigrants, it's black people, and what they all have in common are that they're people of color. Um, we don't see white Muslims, by and large, uh, being attacked. Um, we see Arab Muslims or brown Muslims. So I, I just think that um, we can't put our faith in the party system. We really have to focus on how our government and our society as a whole centers those that are the most marginalized. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one of the things that I like to say is, um, is it from, you know, Finding Nemo? Like, fish are friend, not food, right? <laughs> a politician is a target, not a friend. A politician, even when they're at their friendliest, is always a potential target, right? And one of the things I want to bring up is, just as if you identify as a leftist, just as we on the left have been organizing our folks, the right has been organizing theirs. They've been having membership meetings, they've been having town halls, and I'd argue they've been more successful at popularizing their message than we have. Right. That's one of the reasons we are where we are right now. And the other thing is, um, so, when we speak about solidarity, right? Um, as I mentioned for our hate-free zones, which you kind of also mentioned, like right now, the way we need to go forward to build community power is to build relationships with each other, right? So for our hate-free zones, the tag is love and protect each other. I think you all know where that comes from. Um, we can't be in solidarity with others if we don't love them, mm -hmm. right? And solidarity is not just something that we preach it actually has to be practiced. And it means being uncomfortable. It means sacrifice. One of the ways that we like to break it down in drum is in four levels. Like the first is the symbolic. You're coming out and you're saying you're in solidarity with another group. The next is very transactional. You're willing to turn out for one community if they turn out for you. Then the next is what we saw at JFK, right? Embodied solidarity. You, you are willing as an individual to put your body on the line to protect someone else. The last level, the fourth level, has to be transformative solidarity. It is all of those levels, but on a mass base. Us as communities are willing to do that for other communities, right? One example I'll use is when um, the comprehensive immigration reform was being pushed around, right? Our community in New York would have benefited from that, but we know that it was coming with a lot of enforcement. And enforcement means people along the border being targeted, being oppressed, and in fact would lead to people losing their lives, right? So we were need, turned to our community to talk about that, to be like, okay, this is what it would mean. Sure, it might mean that some of us get papers, but this is what it would mean for the future of all of these folks along the border. And we were willing to make that sacrifice to not support that in that moment. That's a level that's not easy to sustain or easy to get to, right? It requires those constant relationship building within your community and outside of it. Uh, and one of the things around, like, as you mentioned, around being able to, you know, if you see something, being able to intervene or protect your community members, you, nobody knows how to just do that, right? You need the resources to be able to know what to do. If I shows up in your apartment building uh, making a ruckus, one of the tactics they will, do use is trying to embarrass someone from, to open the door. 
they'll make a lot of noise outside so the neighbors come on like, hey, what's going on? Hey, tell your neighbor to open the door. You know, we want you to sleep peacefully, but your neighbor, if they just let us in, will stop making noise, right? If you know that that's the kind of tactics they'll do, you know how to act. So as a part of Hate Free Zones, what we want to do is provide those trainings for everyone and really help build those relationships across communities. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for this incredible opportunity to hear these conversations. My name is Adjo, and I'm the Director of Education here at the Brooklyn Museum. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you to speak to um, we have an incredible team of educators, including teen educators, many of whom come from immigrant families, um, also LGBTQ teens that are really helping us to kind of move forward the conversation of what is the link between the arts, this idea of a radical imagination, and social justice. So I wanted to ask each of you if you could speak both in particular to what you what has been your experience around youth-led movements and how youth are taking the lead in some of the, the initiatives that you've described? And then the second part of the question is what, is, what do you understand the role of the arts in the broad sense of the arts, not just like a painting on the wall, but this idea of culture, or as, as you said, hearts and minds? How do we understand the role of the arts in moving forward towards helping us to develop that imagination muscle, that creative process of seeing what we actually want outside the parameters of what we're given? Yeah, let's... Um So we'll ask a couple of other questions so that, um, and then they'll all answer a couple of questions. Okay. Actually, so, luckily the- Great question about the- about Luckily the it's actually entirely related because I'm, my question is, what advice do you have to folks who are organizing with students around um, immigrants' rights on campuses, and particularly those with very large immigrant, if not almost entirely immigrant communities, and we know, though of course we don't ask, large populations of DACA students. Um, and do you think that the sanctuary campus movement is one that we should continue to organize around? I mean, given the conversation we've been having about sanctuary cities also. So let's do that. Should we do uh, young people in the movement and culture and so forth? Anybody want to take this? Um, I think the art question of like, how do we start activating um, artists within the movement is this resistance isn't really going to be won just in the streets, right? Um, we need every angle to be actually lifted up in this process. And I think that our expression and like protesting is a form of expression, but we also need to have multiple forms of expression showing our distaste and disgust for what's happening at the national level. Um, so I do think that arts, specifically from impacted people, is really gonna start changing the way that we start seeing uh, experiences through other people's eyes. Um, and as a, as a person who grew up organizing as a very, uh, as a young person, um, I think that youth organizing is extremely transformational. And not just in the sense of like community transformation, but individually transformational for the person who's going through it. Um, and I think that once, it, if it, you try to structure it in a way where uh, it's moving the person along with just one campaign that they're placed into as opposed to something that they wanna work on, um, that, that's really disheartening and then it actually turns people away. So how do you build campaigns that are youth built and youth led, um, making sure that they're moving forward? On the sanctuary campus idea, I think that that goes back to um, something Carl said earlier about the DOE sending home that letter um, to parents about like, well, if ICE comes, we'll, send them to the principal's office. It's like, well, uh, if ICE comes, we're closing the, we're chaining the doors locked. They're not coming in. Um, and sanctuary and campuses are amazing. I think you're gonna keep hearing about that, but don't believe the hype all the time because if you read the statement that they put out of what they're gonna do moving forward, are they gonna continue to share data from the school with federal authorities? Are they gonna continue to allow and law enforcement onto campus, are they gonna to continue to actually implement policies that are, are not good for the students 
on campus? Are they going to provide undocumented, documented, and people with in-between status financial aid? That is part of sanctuary. That's, that is part of being a sanctuary campus. So what exactly are they doing? And everyone who does have status right now and may lose it, is the school going to be like, you know what? They lose their status. They're going to keep their job on campus, and we're going to pay them. So I think that that is the other piece of it. So the, I think that we, we tend to get lost in the rhetoric, but we just need to really pay, pay attention to the details because that's what ends up really hurting or helping. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, I think when it comes to young people, I think there's often an assumption that young people aren't developed enough to understand what's going on in the world or that they don't have opinions or that they aren't affected by social justice issues. And I think that that's wrong. Um, in order to, you know, and av having worked as a youth organizer, um, uh, young people have a stake. They have a stake in, in all of the issues that we care about. And they, uh, you know, I think our role um, or the role of adults is to fa help facilitate their involvement, but also to engage them as equals, as leaders. Um, the same way that, you know, you have to educate, you know, your grandma around the kitchen table is something that, you know, you should treat young people the same way, with the same amount of respect and, and, uh, and uh, at times swallow your pride in order to accept leadership from them. Um, because the most, the most powerful organizing that I've seen is when people that are directly impacted actually make decisions and, and play a leadership role and when people um, like myself or those that aren't as impact, impacted step back and take direction and um, you know, swallow our pride and get our hands dirty. Just to the arts question, I don't know if people noticed, um, and it's happened throughout a lot of recent movements as well, and we saw it at the, we, I remember, you know, being so taken aback uh, during the climate march that happened in New York City, just the beautiful art that came out. And even at the Women's March, um, the Amplifier Foundation, we partnered with the Amplifier Foundation and the beautiful posters that came out. Um, really, you know, just kind of aspirational. Art is an opportunity to do a few things. It's about giving people healing space and allowing people to use art as a way to heal. It's also a way to allow people to share their aspirations, whether it be through music or whether it be through actual art um, in the form of, you know, the posters that you saw, or even things as simple as people doing sign-making parties. I mean, some of the most creative signs I've ever seen in my life were, like, during the Women's March, I was like, this is amazing, like, what people were able to do. So I think oftentimes when we're in, in reactionary mode and we're in imminent danger, we think the arts become, like the, like, the last priority, when in fact, that's what people may even need the most, a place to kind of reflect and, 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 and put their, you know, what, what is it that we want? Sometimes people want, are able to reflect that through the art of what is, what, are, what is the world that you want to live in? And to the question about young people, and, and I remind people about this all the time, we think about someone like Congressman John Lewis, and we think Congressman John Lewis was that age, you know, 60 years ago. And some of the most powerful organizing, whether it be in contemporary now, in the past maybe 15, 20 years that I've seen, or when you look historically back in the context of American history, in particular the civil rights movement, we're talking about 17-year-old Diane Nash. You know, we're talking about J Congressman John Lewis, who oftentimes there was a lot of tension between him and the Martin Luther King crowd, who were maybe just a tad bit older than he was, and some of the most, you know, the 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 counter sit-ins, the, the freedom rides, like that was young people, right? We just think about, we don't think about that now because we think of these people and we think of them only as adults in the way that we've been taught, when in fact those people were 17 and 18 and 19 year old college students. Um, and and it's, been, it's been the way that we've been taught that people, that you have to be some sort of like adult that has had some sort of life experience to be able to organize. And even recently, just a few days ago, you know, a young Palestinian Muslim girl who um, is from my organization uh, organized the student walkout um, in, you know, uh, in New York City. And, and, and when you looked at the crowd that came out, here's a young Muslim woman in hijab, and there were black students, and there were white students, and Latinos, and South Asians, and others who came out. Um, and did a walkout out of their school. And the question is, what is our education system? Are we supporting that? 
Are we going to penalize students who want to take the risk and organize and say, I am a young person that wants to stand for something? That's the question to our educators. It's a question to our New York City Public School administrators. I mean, in light of, you know, Betsy Devos, like, what are the teachers going to do? Like, what kind of examples are we going to set for the next generation? Are we going to stand for the privatization of our public education system? Our education system is already in shambles. Just imagine where we're going to go over the years and who's going to be losing here. It's going to be our next generation. And to Murad's point, I mean, I'm a parent of New York City public schools. Um, you know, I tell my kids what to do when they get to school. I said, you know what you need to do in your school? You need to make sure that every classroom has these posters on the doors. And they say, <laughs> and, and it says, refugees welcome here, immigrants welcome here, whatever. And then my daughter takes her little pictures and makes sure that she did what she needed to do. Are we as parents, <laughs> are we as parents who send our kids to New York City public schools, are we encouraging our young people to, to defy, and maybe not defy, but to request to engage in some sort of organizing that reflects their values and how they're feeling as young people of color, or even not a young people of color, even if you're you know, a young white girl and says, you know what, I'm feeling you know, upset about this, I wanna do something about it. Are we allowing our public education system to encourage that type of organizing? So I think to, to end and say the most powerful organizing is gonna to have to be led by young people. We're going to have to respect their judgment and understand also that they come with less baggage and less loyalties than a lot of adults do. And they also are willing to take more risks than a lot of adults are. And the question is, are we gonna allow them to thrive and create the very communities that they themselves are gonna be the ones growing up in? And I think it is our responsibilities on multiple levels of the community, whether or not we're gonna allow that to happen. So from my personal experience, I find it, it's a lot easier to get people to come through to things when arts and culture is involved, mm -hmm. right? If I'm trying to sell people to come out to an action or a rally, that's a lot harder than to say like, hey, there's gonna be like music and dancing and like food and cultural stuff. But we need that. We need the cultural work that can bring people in and also politicize people, right? Cultural work is an act of resistance. It is an act of opposition. And it resonates to people, right? Coming out to protests and rallies, for some folks that might be too high of an ask, right? For folks that aren't like really into uh, the movement, that might be too high of an ask. But cultural work is the easier way to get people in. And we should be like creating space and promoting people to do that work. Um, and you know, like with organizing around young folks, so young, young people are some of the heavily policed groups of people around, right? Uh, there are people at Drum around my age who've, who've been stopped and frisked over 100 times through their high school careers to the point where they're on a first name basis with the officers that were stopping them, right? On the way to school, leaving school. And stop and frisk might not be around anymore, but low-income neighborhoods and the schools in those neighborhoods are still heavily policed. If you go to uh, high schools in those neighborhoods, you'll see police officers waiting after uh, school dismisses to basically move people towards the train station. They don't want them hanging around the neighborhood. And if they try to resist, then that becomes an altercation that then results in the students getting in trouble. Um, and with the sanctuary, camp, uh, sanctuary campuses movement, did anyone see the memo CUNY put out? Basically saying, we're gonna do the same thing we've been doing, which is nothing. So we need students uh, to hold their you know, campuses accountable uh, to their needs and their rights, as well as being able to plug in the community organizations working with the youth to give them the support that they need to organize on campus. Because campus organizing, you don't really have that support, right? And there needs to be a way f to tie that into the community-based organizing. Um, as well, like, that also goes for everyone here, right? Going back to, like, how do we make this a sustained, not just for four years or eight years, but really from now onwards, like, how do we make this a sustained thing? It's about plugging into the community institutions that are there by 
turning our individual people power into our own institutional power in the form of collectives and organizations. I just want to say something about the arts too, which is that uh, Trump just announced too that he wants to eliminate the NEA and the NEH, which of course is the suppression of expression, um, which of course is a form of fascism. So I would say, let's make sure to continue to support the arts in all its forms. All right, last two questions. Why don't we do them together and then we'll, we'll be done. Okay. Hi, this one should be quick. Uh, there are several nonprofit organizations represented on the stage. I assume that you all are overloaded right now and that you could use some volunteer help with grunt work. What do you need and how does one go about volunteering? So I think the, okay, the next question. Yeah, let's do, okay. yeah. So uh, I was just really curious, what could a city like New York, which is on such a national stage, do better to be a sanctuary city? You know, if the federal government threatens them by taking away funding or something like that, how can they resist uh, something like that? Are they, are other cities around the country barring schools from participating with ICE? I mean, what can we do to be better here in New York? Great, thank you. And then I, one, if, are you the last question? Uh, so you, you, yeah, he's also asking questions. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. yeah. <laughs> Um, I was wondering about organizing students in my school around like uh, immigration rights and also other issues. Um, a lot of students went, have been going to protests. Uh, I went with a group to the, the student walkout. Um, but like in terms of like tangible actions, people... <laughs> in terms of like uh, tangible actions people can be taking or like I could help organize people into taking. That's kind of the reason I came to this uh, meeting. Um, and. And uh, the things I pulled out from it were kind of like four, uh, four things, like uh, protests, creating like creating or like expanding spaces for people who are like hurt by these issues, um, uh, maybe like uh, canvassing and people uh, like encouraging students to canvass in their neighborhoods, whether that's they're, whether they're living in a like an immigrant community, and like connecting people to resources, or if they're living in like a more privileged community that I live in, like canvassing for like uh, fundraising and stuff. Um, and then uh, there was a fourth one. I just, uh, <laughs> um, That's great. I'm just, uh, so whatever, I'll skip that. Uh, I was wondering if you guys could, you obviously have a lot of personal experience, if you could speak to any of those points or, or, get, or point me to other actions like uh, me and other students in my school could be taking. That's so, uh, great. Do you want to just go? Are you done? Um. One of the uh, one of the things that's been most discouraging in the last sorry to end on a down note um, in the last few months was um, Governor Cuomo vetoing a, a rather semi decent not great but at least a start uh, criminal justice reform package that would have increased um, you know would have started up a bail fund for indigent um, you know basically it would have at least attempted to try and put some kind of um, um, more power in the hands of public defenders and, and provided a decent bail fund for people who couldn't afford to pay bail. It would have gone some way towards criminal justice reform. Uh, and then two days later, he says, you know, he's really, you know, pro-immigrant. So I, one of the things I've noticed over the last 30 years, which uh, Carl mentioned, this has been a long time coming, is that as the police have gotten more and more power, the courts have gotten sort of slow, have, have gotten progressively stripped of power to defend against the police. Um, is there, are your organizations sort of targeting uh, court side, uh, justice side, defense side uh, reform? So just, um, thank you all so much. Um, it sounds like the, uh, you know, what can we do, building movement and the volunteer, I think those can kind of go together and then maybe we can talk a little bit more about state reform. I do just want to say that, um, well, all of these organizations are on the list, um, and I would encourage you to go to the Brooklyn Community Foundation site and look at our immediate response grants under our Immigration Rights Fund. 
as well as in our Invest in Youth, because our largest portfolio, in fact, is investing in young people. Um, so I'm really delighted to hear what everyone's saying here. And we do have a big focus on immigrant youth. This is long before Donald Trump was elected, um, but it's a great group of nonprofits listed there as well. And keep an eye on our site, because we're going to continue to fund immigrant-led, immigrant organizations in Brooklyn. Um, and take it upon yourself to call those organizations and say, how can I help? But I will also turn it to my colleagues here to, to find out how you can help. So ArabAmericanNY.org. <laughs> um, I, I won't speak on behalf of everyone here, but I will say that um, we welcome volunteers. We have the largest adult education program in our district, um, so we're always looking for volunteers who want to help immigrant women, you know, study for their naturalization exams. It gives an, it's an opportunity to build relationships with people and for people to see people who are not Muslim, who want to come and support them. Uh, front desk assistance, I mean, we our organization is busting at the seams. We, it is a community center, you're welcome to come. We are in, uh, located in Southwest Brooklyn in Bay Ridge. If you're an attorney um, and you have some extra time on your hands, um, we would love, to, we, ha we just have so many people coming in and asking so many questions on people, again, with different immigration status in light of this ban. Um, again, while, there, while there's great news, but CBP doesn't always follow instructions or doesn't also always heed to what the law actually says or what any court says. So there's been a lot of people coming in with a lot of these questions. So if you have time um, to come, we, do, we have our own attorneys, but they're overwhelmed, underpaid, under-resourced. Um, we also, I mean, uh, the Brooklyn Community Foundation has been a pillar um, for our organization for many years, from the days it was called Independence something, Community Bank Foundation or something. Um, but, but also, you know, donations to our organizations um, individually um, is really um, helpful at this moment as we continue to not to be forced in a situation where we have to provide service. These people are coming to us because we speak their language, we live in their communities, we're from their communities. Um, so whatever resources you could provide, um, all donations to our organizations are tax deductible to the fullest extent of the law. Um, and to the question that someone said about like, what do we do as New Yorkers to really be a sanctuary city? And I always say to New Yorkers that we're home to some, probably the majority of billionaires in the United States of America. We're home to some of the largest, you know, uh, you know, prestigious uh, law firms and lawyers. And you know, New York City just has a lot of money. Um, and it doesn't mean that everyone that lives in New York City is rich. Obviously, we know that's not true, but we do have a lot of resources. So what happens when the government says you're not getting sanctuary, or you're, I mean, you're not getting resources for immigration? We could pay for that out of our own pockets. We need to create our own funds, private funds here, so that we can let the government know that we will not allow you to target our communities. We will not allow you to marginalize the most marginalized of our communities. That guess what? What we do in New York, we take care of our own in New York. And that's really the model that we can set nationally, that it's not just about us saying we're a sanctuary city, but we're putting our money where our mouths is, because that's really what where true transformative solidarity comes from. And that's what it looks like when the silent majority stands up and says, we will be silent no more. We will serve those, um, and we will serve our neighbors. And to the last question about Governor Cuomo, and I think uh, Naeem said this really in, in a way that I think is going to stick with me. There are, we got no friends. We got targets. And we also got people that are aspirational and want to run for president of the United States of America. So stay woke about when people are saying what you think is the right thing and when they're not saying what's, and when they're not doing the, the, the right thing. And remember also when uh, our politicians are uplifting one community while throwing another community under the bus. And that's really important as we build solidarity. One thing that I realize in intersectional organizing is that if we're going to lose, we're going to lose together. If we're going to win, we're going to win together. Let us not win on the backs of each other and on the backs of the most marginalized communities, which is what these elected officials have been doing to us for way too long. So I've been losing for 15 years, and I'm good, because I will lose on principles and values. But when I win, I want to know that when I won for my community, it was because I won with LGBTQ communities, because I won with black communities, because I won with women, and I won with Latino and undocumented communities. So let's win together, and let's make sure that these elected officials know that we're all on the same page, that we're all working together, and that we will not allow them to divide and conquer us uh, moving forward. I echo Linda's sentiments. Um, the, sorry about before, the volunteer question got me excited. So, uh, as you guys may have noticed, uh, JFK, like on the 28th, like kind of like, there was like an explosion of love there, right? 
Uh, and one thing we didn't realize is the amount of lawyers we needed. So in the protest itself, we were making announcements saying, if you are a lawyer who's admitted to the Eastern District of New York, please meet us on the ramp. And like, they just started trickling out. And we were like, oh, okay, we got, oh, wow, we have like 100 here right now. And then the call went out on social media. We had over 1,000 lawyers, over 1,000 lawyers up until, and that list is continuously growing because the no ban JFK work is still happening. We got, we left Terminal 4 on Sunday, um, but that, we left the airport, but the work is still happening. So it's just now headquartered out of the NYC, and we're still taking calls, we're still answering emails, we're still helping people out. Um, but that sign-up form wasn't just for lawyers. Uh, we always need help with every aspect that you can think of, from marshalling at protests, to people helping us with comms, people helping us with social media, people literally, at times we just need people to come help us answer phones. And I think that's the reality that we're in, is that when we're asking for people to help or you know, come join our organization, it isn't just like talking about like, give us money, but that's great, um, but actually show up and show up ready to help. And I think that that's something that we noticed. So we do have tons of volunteer opportunities. Visit our website, thenyic.org. Um, and I think that that's something that, um, when we're talking about volunteering, that we have different categories. We're not asking everyone to just come out and marshal. We want people to use their specific expertise and help us amplify what we're doing. Um, one other thing I want everyone to do real quick before time runs out is take out your cell phones real quick. Super quick. You're gonna text NYIC to this number, 86. I'll say it a couple times, guys, it's okay. <laughs> so, phones are out, you got them unlocked, you go to your text messaging, messages app thing, you're texting this number, 86 42 37, and the message you're sending to it is NYIC. So, once you do that, you should get an automated response saying, thank you for signing up for messages from the New York Immigration Coalition. And what we do through that service is send out our action alerts and updates. So a lot of the work, as you guys may have noticed, has been, ha, has been like literally within hours. So we're like, protest JFK, meet us at Battery Park at two o'clock in the afternoon at 10 o'clock in the morning. So everything has been happening and we're using different modes of technology. We wanna see what's actually working. Text messaging has been really great. Um, and we're gonna do a little bit more in-depth analysis of like who's following us at some point, but we don't have time for that now. Um, the political aspect of the question um, that was asked at the end about Governor Cuomo is actually really interesting. So the New York Immigration Coalition, uh, what we do as a coalition and what our mission is, is to help, we're a coalition of uh, immigrant rights and immigrant-led organizations across the state. We have, uh, I think like 130 last year, we ended it off with 200 members across the state from Western New York down to the East End Long Island with the majority of our members in, uh, New York City, the, what we are is a political vehicle for our membership. Um, so our members tell us what our priorities are at the state, federal, and local level. Um, and one thing that was really disheartening to see when the state budget was announced, and I'm that kind of nerd who waits up till like about 10, 11 o'clock when it's, it's released online, and I run through it to see what was allocated where, um, was that there was literally everything that the governor had announced about the immigrant uh, the Immigrant Defense Project, no funding. ONA, the Office of New Americans, no increase. Um, like literally everything he had like come out and been really inspirational about after Trump's win was like, oh, you're doing the same thing again that you usually do. So we have to continuously hold their feet to the fire. Um, and like Naeem said, what Linda's repeated is that none of them are our friends. And we have to realize that early on. And what people tend to forget is that elected officials are public servants, and the servants part is the really important one. They're there to represent us and to do what's best for us. Um, and sometimes they forget that, and we have to help them remember. Um, and once you sign up for our texting service, you'll come out and help us help them remember. Um, but our strategy moving forward at the city, state, and federal level is the federal level right now, we're like, okay, we just have to continuously fight back. Um, at the state and city level and at 
in different counties, um, we're figuring out how do we harden the city and the state from federal policies. And that is what our moves are for this year and next year. So we have like an 18-month plan of these policies, and you guys might have seen the Liberty Bill was introduced last Monday, barely passed, which was shocking, um, which is pretty much starting to build out um, the state not working with federal authorities. So that's, that's one thing that people haven't really been paying attention to, is that the state has always done it. But now we're pushing legislation to ensure that the, that does not happen anymore. Um, and this coming Monday, the Senate's introducing that it'll be introduced in the Senate, um, and I'm hoping followed by a vote that's successful. But that's still iffy. Charles, I can go. Okay, um, and so I will uh, end on an optimistic mode, and um, by channeling my inner Obama. Um, <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, um, you know, I think uh, we're in a crisis mode, which I know doesn't sound very optimistic, but we are in a, we're, in a, we're in a crisis mode. We don't know what's to come. We know what's happened already and what's been threatened. Um, so, you know, we need to remain alert and we need to act as though we're in crisis mode. Oftentimes, you know, I'm, I've been in your seats in the audience at events like this, and I tend to, you know, my mind's like, oh, that's great work they're doing. Um, I, you know, and I rely on those organizations that are on stage for information and to do the organizing and to do the lobbying and to, you know, to, to provide the donations, et cetera, um, without thinking of what I can do. And, um, you know, we're all organizers, we're all philanthropists, we're all advocates. Um, so if you're, uh, I define organizing in its most simplest term as, you know, coming together as a community to build power to win change. So uh, what that means is that if you in your chair can, you know, talk to someone, talk to a friend, talk to a relative, and bring them to a rally with you, or bring them to a meeting with you, or bring them to an event like this, you're taking a step toward building power. So I think in, this, in these times, it's important that we all see ourselves as not just lawyers or artists or um, you know, whatever we do, but also as organizers. Similarly, we're all philanthropists. We don't need, you know, uh, obviously, I, you know, I wish George Soros was paying all of us up here 300 grand a year to do our work. He's not. Um, and you know, uh, we hear philanthropists, we think of George Soros, we think of Warren Buffett and those people, but you're also a philanthropist. If you have $3 in your pocket, you can go to any of our websites and, you know, or not in your pocket, but on your credit card, and <laughs> donate and donate money to us, and you're doing your part. You're, hel you're helping sustain social justice movements. And similarly, we hear a lot about corporate lobbyists. We hear a lot about the ACLU pressuring elected officials and groups taking buses to Albany. You can just walk in the office of your state senator or assembly representative or, or, or a congress, uh, congressional rep and ask whoever's sitting there questions and express your concerns. You don't need our organizations to do that. You can do it yourself. And so, you know, I think I want to leave everyone just with, with uh, you know, uh, with this. It's not just our responsibility to build a movement. Um, it's also yours. I just want to say thank you so much to all of you and thank you very much to the Brooklyn Museum.